Thank you all so much for coming. This is the Navigating the Fault Lines, or as we've called it for the past couple of weeks, Politics 2016. Um, and we have four experts here, at the very least, uh, to talk about how we got to where we are in this election cycle. Today is the Indiana primary, as I'm sure most of you know. If you're showing up to hear about politics, you probably already know that. And we have just the right experts for you. So let me introduce you to former senator and former governor from Indiana, <laughs> Evan Bayh. Uh, also, he wants to be asked him what other titles, because I know he also is a lawyer. And he said, well, father of twin boys, which is also true. Uh, Eric Cantor, who is the former Republican leader in the House, is now vice chair and managing director of Molis and Company. Um, to my uh, direct left is Jason Grumet, who is founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And on the far left, but that's only a geographical thing. To them, it's the far um, right. So. That's, oh, yeah, it's your far right. So um, is uh, Chris Kruger, who is managing director and Washington strategist for, the Guggenheim, for Guggenheim Securities. So, uh, and basically, that means that he advises clients on what's going to happen in politics. So uh, we all know what, uh, what Wall Street is thinking at this point. So I want to start it off with our expert of the moment, Indiana primary. Who's going to win? <laughs> Well, first, let me make it clear. I did vote early, Candy, so I didn't, uh, didn't shirk my civic duty. Uh, Donald Trump is going to win on the Republican side, and it won't be close. And on the Democratic side, it's a coin flip. Uh, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, 51, 49. It could go either way. And we were talking just earlier, and I want you to share with the audience why uh, about the amount of activity in Indiana and why this is so close between Bernie and Hillary. Well, it was close for her eight years ago. She, she won uh, our state uh, eight years ago by less than 1%. And, uh, you know, Sanders' message on trade has really resonated with a lot of blue-collar workers, obviously with students and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't have as large a minority population as many other states. So in that way, we're similar to Wisconsin, where Sanders did well. But the southern part of my state, even Democrats, are more moderate to conservative in southern Indiana. So she will do better there. Uh, but what I was sharing with uh, Candy earlier, uh, the Sanders campaign, I mean, who knew socialists had so much money? He, he, he's outspending her, five, six to one. So in my state, it's been saturation Sanders ads on TV now for two and a half weeks, saturation radio, saturation direct mail. The Clinton campaign decided to spend nothing, not a single dollar. And so, uh, you know, that can have an impact, and um, that's one of the reasons it's, it's going to be close. The Clinton campaign decided what the, 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 the popular vote tonight really is just about bragging rights, that the delegates are what really matter. And under our proportional rules in the Democratic Party, because it's going to be close, they're going to split the delegates no matter what. I personally would have made a different decision because if he happens to win tonight, they could have spent $500,000 in my state and kind of sewed this up. If he happens to win tonight, he'll raise another $10 million over the Internet. So we'll see. But that's one of the reasons it's close. He's just inundating the airwaves, and, and she's not. Eric, and, and you all down here as well, um, talk to me about how we got here. Um, up here, I, d I don't know about you, Senator, or even uh, you, Congressman. It, I have been consistently wrong since January of last year about what was going to happen. Um, I have misinformed students at Harvard. Um, I have, you know, and every, and we talked about how every time you think, okay, now we know what's going to happen. How did, how did this get to this point? Well, Candy, I join you in being in the crowd that has been all wrong um, because, uh, you know, I remember back in January, I predicted publicly at Davos that Donald Trump was not going to win one state. Uh, so I do now take a lot of uh, humility about that. and That was the general election you were referring to, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and, you know, I was uh, chairing Jeb Bush's campaign at the time and, and thought these things would work out a lot differently. And I think if you want to set aside sort of the mechanisms and the process in the primary, because that did have something to do with it, when you had such a crowded field, and most of that field happened to be former or existing office holders, all battling for the same swath of the electorate. And then you had Donald Trump out here in a much different outsider mode. Um, I, I think, again, set that aside. And, and what is really going on with the electorate? Well, certainly there's just a lot of anger out there. There are a lot of people who feel very left out uh, in this economy. And I think if you 
if you look at the macro numbers, I mean, the figures, certainly the, the equities markets are up, interest rates are down, gas prices are relatively low still. All of this should be inuring to the benefit of families. But I think, suffice it to say, look at the median household income numbers. They've been stagnant for 15 plus years. And, and people in, in these public polling, um, Candy, that you and I have talked about, I think is, they're alarming. More and more Americans are saying, hey, wait a minute. This notion of the American dream of my kids having it better than I do is, not, is no longer something that I believe in. And that is striking to the core of what um, I think is appealing to some about Donald Trump. And um, I, my worry is the policy prescriptions, the solutions to address some of these problems has not, has not been present at all in this debate. And that's what's worrying me every day. Yeah, solutions not much I could, uh, I'll build on what Eric said a little and then maybe add one new theme. And I guess I would make a s subtle shift from anger to fear because I think it actually motivates a better understanding of a solution, right? So, you know, anger is basically fear plus pride, which isn't great, but it's better than resignation. And so the question is how do we channel and what's the source of that anger? I absolutely agree. It's economics, right? People talk about broad demographic shifts and internet. It's, it's household. So, you know, as Eric said, you know, median income down. Um, half of the adult population says that it could not get its hands on $2,000 if they had a month. So that's fear, right? That means you're, you're one car accident, health, bad air conditioner away from not being able to pay your bills. Um, at the same time, median income is going down. Cost of in-state tuition which is hope, up by 66% since 2000. So people are afraid of the moment. They're not hopeful for the future. And that's obviously been channeling a lot of this anger. I think that the theme, though, that I want to add, which is not as commonplace, is democracy's never been a cozy art. It's always been a contact sport. The history of this country is not you know, people coming together in kind of gentle kumbaya. It's, it's constructive collision, right? It's, it's controlled violence. We used to have institutions that had the capacity to manage that kind of aggression that's inherent in a pluralistic society. And the we, which people call the establishment, which is a terrible word, but I think of it as the governing people, people involved in this solution who believe that we can kind of solve things through the system. We've been belittling that system, passively and actively, for the last 30 years. And so when people ask the question, you know, why didn't the establishment have a fifth gear? I think it's absolutely a kind of a tactical collision of a lot of people running for the same space. But we have a president who basically doesn't like politics that much, been complaining about it since he got there. We have members of Congress who spend $10 million to get the seat and then tell their folks that all they want to do is get the heck out of town. They don't buy houses, they don't rent houses. Dozens of members of the House of Representatives sleep in their offices, which is just kind of icky, in addition to not creating the opportunity for the kinds of collaboration that over the years has basically made the country work. So, I actually think that both parties are having a near-death experience. My hope is that that reminds those of us who want to govern that democracy is actually a pretty fantastic thing. We're going to have to start fighting for the capacity to deliberate and bring a little bit of our own fear and anger to the system. Yeah, I mean, I think the, a way to kind of contextualize what's happened in 16 so far between Trump and Sanders anyway is that these are both basically corporate raiders making a bid on, on their parties. Trump has largely been successful in his hostile bid with the, you know, the board of directors, the establishment, basically advocating for a poison pill, which is Ted Cruz, hoping that maybe the, the angel investor comes in in Cleveland, which is Paul Ryan. But I mean, so, so I mean, Trump, Trump has been successful. He's going to be the nominee. There's a decent chance he's the next president. On the Democratic side, what you're seeing with Sanders who isn't even a shareholder of the Democratic Party, um, has largely going to fail because the board of directors owns all the preferred shares in the form of superdelegates. So I mean, that, I think that's one way to, one way to think about you know, what, what we're seeing with, with Trump and Sanders. Um, and Sanders, is in, regardless, you know, the, both of these parties are going to look radically different uh, at the end of the election. You know, one of the things I think that goes along with this, and I'd love to hear your all's opinion on this, is um, how did we miss it? How did we not know? I mean, more than 10 million people at this point have voted for Donald Trump in a primary. I think uh, Bernie's numbers are like six or seven million so far, and his caucuses, obviously, it's a little hard to tell. Um, so we missed a significant, you know, millions of people 
who find what the establishment finds to be really objectionable. Right? We, we couldn't possibly be Donald Trump. Don't want Trump. So someone that we all sat around going, yeah, this isn't going to happen. Don't worry about it. It's a summer fling. Well, when they start getting serious and voting, it'll be different. I mean, just on and on and on and on. We completely missed it. I mean, my feeling is it has a lot to do with flyover country and about the people that both report the news and make the news, that it's just a wholly different, um, if you will, 1% view. <laughs> Uh, even though monetarily, I can assure you, you know, not all journalists are in the one percent. Um, but it's, it, you know, to me, there is such a large dis disconnect between what these people want because it's been, oh, it's angry white guys without jobs. It's more than that. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Trump won Greenwich, Connecticut, by seven points. I mean, this, you know, this is not just the flyover stuff. I mean, he wins everywhere. Um, sort of the, you know, if you think about sort of the, the, the tripod, three things in the general that, you're, that we're expecting. Number one, it's a race to the bottom. Uh, Trump, though, is going to have about a two and a half month head start after he wins tonight, consolidating that base where Hillary, even if she wins tonight, is going to lose the next three in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Oregon, where people are really feeling the burn and really, you know, in, into Sanders. Uh, Clinton is going to have to do something to get Sanders millennial votes, which are sort of like flaccid at best, liking Hillary. Uh, number two, you've got a major, I mean, as much as policy is going to matter, it's really not this election because I think the general election is as simple as this. And that is that if the general election is a referendum on Trump, Hillary wins. If the general election is a referendum on Hillary, Trump wins. Can I add something to Candy? Yeah, Evan, I was going to well, ask you. To answer you about your question, there's actually a growing body of academic literature about uh, the disaggregation of American society. And so I think what's going on, we've, there used to be people served in the military together was a common experience. They belonged to the PTA together, there was a common experience. The book Bowling Alone was written. There used to be bowling leagues people participated in, not so much anymore. So elites in our country, it tends to be an echo chamber tend to read the same things, talk to the same people, even you know, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, we, if you're at sort of an elite level, you tend to talk to one another and not so much you know, out there with what's going on. So this anger, this frustration has bubbled up and it's ma manifesting itself in ways that the elites couldn't have anticipated because it's just so foreign to them. And you know, look at the, the Donald, every time he says something and people say, well, that's the end of him. Well, for a lot of Americans, it shows that he's authentic, he's real, he's not like those politicians who always are politically correct and so forth and so on. So I wanted to make that point, but I would disagree with one thing that was I just said. I think that uh, uh, if it's a Donald Trump, a Hillary Clinton race, it's highly likely Hillary Clinton will be the next president of the United mm -hmm. States. And the reason I say that is because of the Electoral College. Uh, you remember President Gore? Okay. Um, <laughs> So I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the popular vote was very close, but the one takeaway I would recommend to you, in the last six consecutive presidential elections, 24 years, almost a two and a half decades, uh, the Democratic candidate has carried six consecutive times states totaling 242 electoral votes, 242. The Republican in those same six uh, uh, consecutive elections, 102. There were two polls out this week uh, that if Hillary, that had Hillary Clinton up 14 points in Florida, the other one had her up nine, one of them was taken by the Chamber of Commerce, so it wasn't exactly a Democratic Party organ. If she just wins the, six, the, the states that have been won by Democrats six times in a row, plus Florida, it's over. That's it. She what? has 271 electorals. And so just mathematically, the, the different combinations, the, and it used to be this way for the Republicans in the 70s and 80s, they had a lock on the, Repu on the Electoral College. Uh, but now it's almost the reverse. There are just mathematically many, many more combinations to get to 270 electoral votes if you're the Democrat than if you're the Republican. The Republican can get there, but he practically has to run the table. So let, let me respond to that because, I, I, you know, again, I'm not going to be in the business of either disputing it or not, just to pose um, a different line of thought because, um, you know, what this, the, the conventional wisdom is exactly what Evan just said. Uh, that all the polling would indicate that if Donald Trump and Hillary are up against each other, um, of course Hillary Clinton wins. Well, again, this conventional wisdom has been what's wrong the entire season. Many of us have been advocates of conventional wisdom. So, you know, you look at the turnout that has been present in these primaries. 
I know it was about a month ago, I saw some figures that said that the Republican turnout in primaries was up 63%, if not 67%, where the Democratic turnout was um, down 23%. And there's all kinds of theories about pr primary turnouts and whether they convey or, or correlate to general election. Typically not. Then they say, well, it has to do with the competitiveness of the primary. And if it's competitive, you're going to have higher turnout. Well, certainly the Democratic uh, race has been competitive. So none of this quite jives 100%. But let me, let me try and answer your question about how did we miss it. And I do agree with Evan that the conversation that goes on uh, between those two sides in Washington is totally in conflict or absent from the concerns out there amongst the electorate. And I know from my party's standpoint, we've been very fixated for the last seven years during this president's administration on trying to do something about all the issues that many of us care about, which is the fiscal sustainability of our country. That if we can't get that straight, if we can't reduce the deficit, uh, balance the budget, create an economic uh, environment for more risk-taking and investment, none of this is, nothing's going to happen for the people we represent. So we've been focused on these issues of uh, percentage of government spending to GDP. We've been focused on the issues of unfunded liabilities of Medicare. Well, you know what? The people that are coming out for Trump, they have no interest in hearing that babble. Even though we know that that's the right thing to do, somehow my party has been focused on these very important issues, but absolutely missing the boat as far as working middle class people are concerned, and that's what I think is going on. So from my party's standpoint, we got a lot of work to do to be able to go reconnect why our solutions even matter to people anymore. I, at some point, I think the word income gap ought to come up as well, because I think if there is something deep down in the roots of all of this, it goes there. But I, I also, let me just back up before we move on to some other things. And paint me a scenario. I mean, okay, fine, everybody thinks Donald Trump's going to lose, except for West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. The, the Rust Belt. Michigan. Right, right. Rust Belt. It's right? I mean, those are normally, uh, some of them are swing, but those are normally uh, Democratic states. And this is where, you know, I mean, this electoral college is a funny thing, you know? So you could see, you know, we were talking about this a little bit, you, you could see Trump lose popular vote by a lot. He could lose California, Illinois, you know, Illinois by, by millions, and squeak out one of those, I think, you know, unusual paths. And so I guess, you know, I, I do think, and I think, you know, Evan used the word uh, humility, we all recognize that the usual logic does not apply. I mean, when I, I have tried to get outside my little filter bubble, and anytime I meet anybody who is a Trump supporter, really try to engage why. And it is not that he has Teflon. He has a perpetual motion machine for saying crazy stuff, because it actually vindicates the notion that he is saying it like it is. And I think it, it is that sense, not only that you know, the parties have lost touch with the narrative, that sense of kind of inside dealing, incapacity to follow through, to basically solve problems has created such a sense that we'll take a jerk if we think he's telling us the truth over somebody who we think is kind of giving us the poll tested numbers. And, and that- goes to the authenticity, I think. It, and if you look back at the last several elections, the authentic candidate has won just about all of them. And I won't go through, but you know, you know who these folks are, right? Read it through in your own mind. Um, Gore, Kerry, didn't win. I mean, look, against any other garden variety Democrat versus Trump, I don't think it's particularly close, but everyone's always quick to point out that Trump has the lowest numbers of any presidential candidate going into the fall. True, like obvious. You take Trump out of that poll, Hillary Clinton has the lowest numbers of any candidate going into the fall. I mean, you're really, you're nominating two of the most polarizing people on the planet. Um, and it's, it's, it's a race to the bottom, and it's who, who, do, you, who do you hate more? Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think the, the polling which, which you're looking at before we... raises the question. I, I agree with that. I mean, I, and I agree with what he said earlier. I think Trump will try and make it a referendum on Clinton. Clinton will try and make it a referendum on Trump. They'll both succeed, and they'll both be very unpopular, which raises the question, how do you govern, do govern after an election like that? Right, which is, thank you very much, where we were going. I wanted to just make some assumptions here, and now that you all are not in elected office, you, you have to answer hypotheticals. Um, <laughs> Somehow that's backwards. <laughs> I don't know. That's right. So let us assume that Hillary Clinton wins. 
What happens down ballot, and by that I mean House and Senate, and what could she, what could feasibly get done? I mean, there's a lot of issues out there. I know tax reform is something you all have talked about. Um, immigration reform. I mean, we could just, you know, go on down the infrastructure. line. Infrastructure. It's the happiest, Infra the happiest word in American politics. Right? Um, you know, which also usually translates to jobs. Mm -hmm. So what, how does a Hillary Clinton, what, what happens down ballot, and how does Hillary Clinton as president work with that? Well, I'll just well, say, I mean, it, it, it is hard to see Republicans losing the House under almost any scenario, and we've, you know, red teamed it a couple of different times. I think a Hillary presidency, um, you'll probably have a Democratic Senate. I mean, one thing about the Senate, we're going to be tossing the ball back and forth every two years for the foreseeable future just based on wacky math. So this year, 33 senators up every year. I believe it's 25 of the folks protecting seats this year are, are 24 Republicans. 2018, 25 protecting the seats are Democrats. 2020, I think it's 20 folks protecting the seats are Republicans. So we've just gotten into this bizarre kind of cyclical, you know, I'm the freshman, I'm the senior, and we're supposed to, you know, kind of undercut each other going forward. But I guess I think the Clinton presidency with a Republican House and a Democratic Senate has the capacity to govern. Not going to be transformational, but has the capacity to govern. And I, I would end just by saying, as bad as it is, it's not as bad as most people think. Right? Congress has about a 9% approval rating. I think that's understated by about a factor of three. I think they deserve something in the, in the low, you know, kind of low 30s, high 20s. If you look back at the last year, Senator McConnell deserves some credit for bringing kind of the deliberative process back to the Senate. I mean, we've actually passed a dozen reasonably significant bills. We reformed Medicare payments, which was going bankrupt. We did the Children's Health Insurance Program. We addressed the NSA metadata spying. Congress worked through the Iran deal, which wasn't pretty, but it wasn't nearly as ugly as it could have been. No, but it didn't work through the Iran deal. I mean, I'm, I'll take a little bit of issue with this. Please. Because I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think right now we're in a position to see a lot of productivity. Um, it didn't work through the Iran deal because the House decided it was just not going to play by the rules and passed another resolution, so it stopped. You know, so um, I, I, I think well, that... Compared to the Tom Cotton letter basically saying, you know, we you know reject what? our president's no, authority, I think no, the outcome no, could have been worse. No, nobody out in middle America knows that any of that stuff passed. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, no, I agree. But I, I think the casually, honestly, Candy, of this whole process, and if there is a Clinton or a Trump presidency, uh, it's about um, immigration, it is about trade, and it is about foreign, uh, foreign affairs and whether the U.S. should intervene internationally. Those are the three casualties, I think. And first of all, in the free trade question, you see even in my party, which was always the pro-trade party, there is just tepid, if you will, support for TPP. And so I think a lot of the rhetoric is going to result in a less friendly Congress for free trade, and it will provide some real difficulties for a new administration. And I think, obviously, the immigration issue that Donald Trump has so wrapped his arms around is going to be a lasting consequence, unfortunately, and very little progress made on that. Yeah, whether you agree with it or not, uh, unless they pass it in the lame duck session, trades off the agenda. It's getting trashed by both the right and the left. But I, I was actually going to agree with Jason uh, and say, so you want an optimistic scenario in, a, in the midst of all the gloom and so forth? Here's how I think this deal could work. So the president's going to be elected, very unpopular. You, you said assume it's Hillary Clinton. Uh, you've got a new Democratic leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, who's more of a natural you know, deal maker than Harry Reid. Uh, you're going to have the Republicans in the Senate who, as he was mentioning, just have had a taste of governing for a couple of years, passing things. Oh, that tasted pretty good. You got a new leader in the House who's a very impressive, uh, Paul Ryan. He's, I think, Paul, he's a principled conservative, but at the end of the day, I think he would like to get things done. He's going to have to learn how to deal with that Tea Party faction he's got, but I think his natural instincts are to try and get things done. And you're going to have a president. I was with her on Sunday, I was with her husband the day before. They're not dumb. Okay, they're gonna, they know that if they're going to get anything done in that configuration, they're going to have to try and govern from the middle. So what might that look like? It might look like an infrastructure program. As Jason was mentioning, it might look like corporate tax reform to make the corporate code more uh, globally competitive. It might be immigration reform. It might be some of these things that have some appeal to some parts of the Republican Party. Is all that going to happen? No. But I think there's at least a shot where there's a window there that maybe you can make things happen. At least I'd like to think so, See, and I think that's how it happened. And this is what the frustrating part is, because we'd all, as thinking rational people, would like to see that happen. The problem has been 
we've been woefully underperforming, the government has, in the last seven years. Something's got to change, and it, it does, and the only thing that will change will be leadership. And I hope you're right that there will be a commitment to leadership, and leadership means taking risks. And so when you, can you imagine, so if you think Hillary's going to uh, govern from the center, which means that all this pressure and intensity we're seeing by Bernie Sanders, all that will have to be pushed back. And the only reason, I think, from an outside standpoint that I think that is being pushed back now is you've got great party rules which allow insiders to support Hillary. By governed from the center, Eric, I was meeting her legislative agenda. Now, from a regulatory perspective, the things that she's got, she can just do unilaterally? No, I think she'll need to do a little but more to satisfy you, the progressive how, base. How can she go to the center when her party is going to be so pressured by the far left? And th this, is, and this right. is my experience, having been whip and having been leader. The, the, the incentives in place for members of Congress um, nowadays are very much influenced by some of these outside advocate groups. And you've got to be willing to take them on. So she's going to have to do yeah, that if you protect her members. Last thing I say, Candy, yeah. and then I'll be quiet. If you're, if you're a, a, an objective outside observer and you're you know, betting the farm, you'd probably bet that it won't work. But if you're the president-elect and you're sitting there and you've got a Republican House and the Senate's going to be closely divided no matter what, there's no easy path. They're both tough, but you've got two paths. You can say, okay, I'm not going to get anything done for four years. I'm, I'm in the office. I'm in the, living in the big house, but that's about it. I'll rule by uh, you know, <laughs> re regulation. I can do some stuff on foreign policy. When you said big house, Senator, you just to clarify, <laughs> you meant the, the White, white the House. The White House. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. The big White House, that's correct. <laughs> no, I don't, th I, I don't think there's any they're, risk. They're live of, tweeting in the back. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any risk of the other. Uh, but the point I wanted to make, or, is, or you can try and get some things done and risk the wrath of some elements of your own party. Right. I think that that's the choice that she will make. There's always another election. I, I want to get you in on this simply because you can either answer the what would a Hillary Clinton presidency look like, or you can move us on to what would a Donald Trump presidency look like. And I don't want to be like tagged as the Trump guy, but uh, I mean, what, what is regardless, whoever wins, the first thing they have to do is is get the Supreme Court uh, nominee through. And if Hillary wins, suspect Republicans would try to confirm Garland in the lame duck because he is as good as they're going to get. I mean, he's basically a center-left John Roberts. Um, I could also see Garland maybe take a knee, and uh, you know, Hillary's first move on January 20th is nominate, you Obama. know, the, the liberal equivalent of Scalia. Um, but um, I mean, that don't forget. I mean, the Supreme Court is very much in the balance uh, with this election. Um, with look, with if Trump wins, almost definitionally, he's got Speaker Paul Ryan and Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. You have the reconciliation process. So you can do, I mean, you can do all the Obamacare stuff. You can do all the tax reform stuff. You could probably throw some entitlement reform stuff in there as well. I mean, having... It, the problem is, again, the, the Senate parliamentarian, Evan, can speak to this. They're not going to allow those multiple things under reconciliation right. all at once. So you're right. You can do most of... Uh, I think tax reform, if it were a Trump presidency, um, I think that's probably where they go. It doesn't I mean, it generally... Trump in general, yeah. just a... And I'll quote one of my great um, colleagues and not name her, who basically said, you know, if you could get beyond the misogyny, some implications of <laughs> racism, general thuggery, and the risk of a war with North Korea, <laughs> other than that, he'd be really interesting on domestic policy. <laughs> because, you know, there is not a governing ideology there, right? There is a, I mean, they checked po um, Trump's tweets, did a word cloud. The four words in order were, I, you, great, and Trump. <laughs> so just in terms of just kind of meta messaging, like he's got something there. But that's his governing philosophy. And so you know, our view would be you know, appeal to his sense of I, you, great, Trump. Take your own agenda. Remind him that it was his idea. And you know, so there, 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 there is, there's, there's policy chaos, which is frightening, but compared to the kind of tribalism of the last four years, kind of interesting. I would love to see the conversation with Trump and the Senate parliamentarian on the parliamentarian telling <laughs> Trump what he can and can't do. Right. <laughs> or even the lawyers of the Justice Department telling him what he can and can't do. Um, which generally always comes first when they think I'm president. I mean, the one thing I will say about presidents is the minute they get in the White House, I've never known one whose first thought wasn't, when they were involved in policy, wasn't, 
well, being leader of the Western world is not as powerful as it sounds. You know, there's lots of, I mean, there are, there are many checks and balances beyond the ones we learned about in third grade. So, uh, you, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that the people campaigning and what they're campaigning are never come out in their, you know, purest form. They, as we all remember, Barack Obama uh, campaigned against an individual mandate. Well, and it was worth, one of the first worth things noting, just a, a moment of kind of historical reflection. You know, the Constitution was actually designed as a guard against tyranny and a monarchy. So you know, a lot of what has frustrated us as a sclerotic, you know, bicameral, laborious process might become quite attractive in a Trump presidency in terms of recognizing that we do have a system of governance that does not allow any single person to dictate outcome. But, you know, and I think the, sa the amazing thing, I think you're right, who knows what Donald Trump is for? I mean, really, if you say, you know, if, if you say he's for America first, fine. Uh, if he's for engagement internationally, he'll the next day say he's not. So you really, it really is a flip of a coin. And I think when people go to the polls um, uh, in November, if it is he versus Hillary, I, I think the thinking is, you know, you, you got a 50-50 shot with Donald that he gets it right on the business issues, on the whatever issues that float your boat. But with Hillary, it's certainly... Um, she's taken definitive stands, and the process has forced her to the left. And again, I'm a little bit more um, uh, reticent to say she can easily go to the middle. I, I really am, because I think that the pressures within the caucuses on the Hill are really fierce. And, and members don't get elected with the president necessarily, especially midterms. I, I can't speak to the House. I can only speak to the Senate. And uh, if the administration didn't govern from the middle, you can kiss the Senate goodbye in two years. And those guys uh, and women all have a keen sense of self-preservation. And so it's not just doing the right thing, it's the politics also, Eric. That, uh, well, that's you know, what I'm saying, the politics. Because a lot, a lot of them are from sort of uh, you know, pinkish type states. And whereas in the House, the, the, the fact is now they're so gerrymandered right. that it just behooves people in a self-existential way to go vote to the extreme. Well, that's right, and that's why this Supreme Court uh, decision is so tough. I mean, in either party, if they acquiesce in a president of the other party getting to pick the fifth justice from the Supreme Court to break all these tie votes, a whole lot of them are going to get primaried. Democrat or Republican, they'll yep. get primaried. Yep. There's no easy way out of that one. Let me talk a minute about the parties, and I want you all to know that we have questions ready because we do want to hear what... All of them actually, to me, express an interest in hearing what you were interested in knowing about any questions you may have. So, um, but talk to me about the parties. Can the Republican Party survive a Donald Trump um, nomination? And by that I mean you now see that there's this, this whole, um, yeah, let's just accept Trump and worry about the Senate and the House. And like, let's just assume he's going to be a wash, and right after he gets defeated, we'll rebuild the Republican Party. I'll just say, we, you know, we have weakened the political parties, which used to be something people thought was kind of fun. Um, what we didn't predict was the combination of McCain-Feingold and Citizens United, right? So McCain-Feingold squeezes down the parties, and whatever you think about you know, money and politics, you can make arguments both sides. Citizens United said, rip the roof off, everybody else gets to run the country. And so... You know, I, again, I would come back to suggesting that we actually need to step back and reflect on how do we create institutions that allow us to kind of control that natural anger. And I think strengthening the parties is something that we're going to see some bipartisan interest in for the purposes of party survival. The only other thing I would toss in there, and there's not a lot of historical examples here, I think the Republican Party is going to be okay. I think you're going to see both parties change and start to address this. But you know, the, the best analogy um, I could find was um, Teddy Roosevelt, 1912, busted out of the party. Remember the bull moose? He announced that he was, uh, we were at Armageddon in a battle with the Lord. Right? Pretty aggressive language. It was a one-shot one deal. You know, I, I don't think Trump becomes a regular. Candy, can I, it, it, twice in our lifetimes, us, all of us up here on the stage, my party has carried one state. Right. You got to work real hard to carry one state. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, Democratic Party didn't you know, blow away. And so parties have a way of revitalizing themselves, and you know, the Republicans will too. 
And if he should win, if Trump should win, what does that do? Does that, t by its very nature, change what the Republican, I mean, he's got an R by his well, name. Don't you have to, like, claim that and break it? Well, I, I would bet the farm then on the Democrats in the midterm elections in two years. <laughs> right, and, and listen, who knows? Right, because again, part of what happened midterm in 2010, the reason why we were cast into the majority in the House, was because of the overreach and the one-way street of Obama. It was stimulus, it was Dodd-Frank, it was Obamacare, it was all the regulatory push that began. And the public said, hey, wait a minute. There wasn't any great mandate for Republicans, it was just we need a check and a balance. So who knows with Donald Trump? I mean, you don't know whether he's gonna be extreme or whether he's gonna be balanced or whether he's gonna be about striking a better deal. I mean, who knows? So, I mean, I, I think that the, the, um, if you believe that um, he's really going to be able to upend convention, electoral college convention, and the rest, um, the, the primary motivator is going to be anti-Hillary. It is going to be the public saying, you know what, enough of the Clintons. We've seen it. We've had it. We don't want it anymore. Um, who knows whether that will take hold or not. If that take hold, takes hold and he wins, I do think, Candy, you're right, that, that Republicans will, will be there. Um, some will be very disgruntled because those that are most disgruntled right now are those that are true conservatives that haven't heard a lot when it comes to policy prescriptions from Donald Trump that reflect that limited government, limited temperament, focus, that many of us believe is the right way to go. So we'll see. So, I mean, after the 2012 uh, loss, the RNC sort of commissioned sort of the autopsy report, right? The two, the two, big, two big takeaways for that for, you know, Republicans on a go-forward basis need to do a better job appealing to college-educated women and need to tone down the rhetoric on uh, illegal immigration and Hispanics. <laughs> so you literally are going to nominate, you know, as- We're going to exhume the body after this yeah, one, I mean, right? it's, uh, so I mean, it, they've, I mean, they're basically, you know, you're going to double down with Trump on, on both of those things. But I mean, the, I think why you saw 17, you know, candidates uh, running for the Republican nomination of an incredibly talented yeah. group of folks um, is that the party really since 08 has sort of been, I don't know if rudderless is the right, but I mean, it, it's typically after you lose the White House, your party comes together, you figure it out why you lost, um, you build some scar tissue, you get on the same page and you move forward. Yeah. Um, and that didn't happen in, in 08, 09, um, you know, with, with, you know, Obama unified against all things Obama, which is why you had everybody from Lindsey Graham to Rand Paul on foreign policy, why you have everybody from Mike Huckabee to, you know, Jeb Bush on economic policy. I mean, you have these, I mean, I'm not sure what the Republican platform is on social policy, on monetary policy, on economic policy, on foreign policy. Right. Sometimes it takes a third beating for the most... <laughs> the most <laughs> strident voices in a party to realize they can't get everything. Uh, in my party, it was uh, at the 1988 election following two terms of Ronald Reagan. Uh, George H.W. Bush then beat uh, Michael Dukakis, another liberal, a good man, I served with him as governor, but a liberal from the Northeast, lost my state by 20 points. And so then, it, it, finally, the Democrats said, we've been out for 12 years. A lot of the more liberal elements said, okay, Maybe we got this guy from Arkansas seems kind of more moderate. Maybe maybe that's what it takes to win, and uh, you know he barely got the nomination, then barely won the election. But so, sometimes you got to be out for a little longer to kind of reconcile your internal differences. And my guess is, if the Republicans do experience another beating this fall, four years from now they'll be much more formidable. And Senator, before we take um, audience questions, uh, let me ask you because we, you know, it's all been about is the Republican Party dying and what if this happens, et cetera. You have Hillary Clinton, who is a, a you know, skilled politician, who is who is a policy wonk, who does know her stuff, who is, was quite pop more popular than Michelle Obama at one point while she was serving as Secretary of State, and she can't defeat a 71-year-old socialist, um, uh, you know, on the campaign, and she has, he I has- I think maybe 74. Okay, okay, oh, is it 74? Oh, okay, 74. 74 um, is the new 71. Okay, so. okay gotcha. Socialist um, math. So, you know, can't beat him, and in fact has, changed her position on, t on trade, 
uh, changed her position on Keystone Pipeline, uh, changed her position on a number of things. So people are looking and thinking, is she really all that strong of a candidate? And is the Democratic Party, it, in any other election cycle, would be quite a story that he is still holding her feet to the fire. It's just that all the you know, fireworks and stuff are on, well, the, on the Republican side. Well, it is quite a story, no doubt about it. It's kind of remarkable, actually. But we've been spent a lot of time talking about Donald Trump. There are big parts of the Democratic Party that feel that anger and that frustration, that ec economic angst, too. And so it's manifesting itself. You know, the, 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 on the right, people want their answer. They're mad. They want less government. On the left, they're mad. They want more government. And, but it's the same, you know, the same uh, phenomena, the economic that uh, Eric was describing, the stagnant real wages for 15 years, that's eating at people on the left as well. And so somebody comes along, you mentioned she's a policy wonk, uh, that's true, and that may be in some respects a liability because it prevents her from saying, guess what, you know, everybody can have free college tuition and somebody else will pay for it. Guess what, uh, we can have, you know, universal health care and somebody else will pay for it. By the way, in his own home state of Vermont, when they figured out how high the taxes were going to be to pay for the thing, it wasn't even adopted in the state of Vermont. But we're going to do it for the whole rest of the country as well, including all those red states out there. Oh, and how about Social Security? It may be running a deficit, but forget all that. We're going to increase your pension. And somebody else will pay for that too. Uh, you know, if you're out there and you're sitting at a kitchen table and you're having trouble making ends meet and somebody comes along and says, I'm going to give you free all this stuff and you don't have to do anything, for some people, they think, well, I don't know if that you know, adds up, but let's give it a shot, okay? And so there's some of that going on, too. But she's going to hold on and she's going to win. But it, it, is, it is remarkable that he's doing as well as he's doing. Yeah. And uh, Senator By, uh, I guess people know, supports Hillary Clinton. Just thought we better put that out there. I am uh, not a socialist. That is true. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I get that on the record a right now. Democratic socialist. That's Senator. right, Democratic <laughs> socialist. All right. So we would love to open it up if you all have questions. And there's someone here with a mic. Why don't you just raise your hand and the mic people will find you? Looks like you got one right there, Kenny. If I can help you, blinded by the light. Yes, uh, I am. There wrapped up like Barry Bonds. You need a visor. I, I'll do it. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, a great presentation, very, very informative. Uh, Mr. Cantor, you talked about leadership. However, for the past seven, seven years, the Tea Party wing of the Republican, Republican Party have consistently rejected President Obama's legislative efforts with no clear solutions. But for the, but for the Tea Party, you probably, would be, you probably wouldn't be here and we might be calling you speaker. But, but for Mitch, the Supreme Court would, would not have a vacancy. So how can you govern when you don't have leaders on the other side to negotiate with because the Tea Party has hijacked? Right, the Tea Party, so the shortened version of that, I think, is just the Tea Party is still going to be around. All right, let me, let me just try and dispute a little bit of the uh, assumptions there because I think a lot of what um, you know, happened in my race is, was a little like canary in the coal mine of what's going on today. Um, I got beat by the Democrats. You know, I, I still want a majority of Republicans. We didn't have a Democratic primary going on in Virginia at the day. Third of the electorate shattered all records in my primary, almost 70,000 voters. We're Democrats. Again, my political mistake, whatever. So again, I don't necessarily think um, that it was predominant, certainly contributing to the cause. Now, that's number one. Number two, about um, the willingness to negotiate. Correct. There is great difficulty in the House conference uh, today um, that Paul is seeing that he doesn't have the entire 218 that he needs to solidify a deal. Not correct that we didn't proffer solutions because I was right there with John Boehner when we went to the president and said, hey, we want to work with you. And again, what happened after that initial push was we were set aside. I know the press didn't cover it that way. But I can tell you, I myself walked in with a white paper with enumerated things that we wanted in the stimulus bill. So what do you do? How is it? And this was why I was saying in the, in the discussion before is whether we can have a hopeful prospect for something to occur. And I said leadership because leadership on the part of a President Clinton or a President Trump, which means go and engage with members of Congress respect who they are, no matter whether they're Tea Party or not, develop those relationships and the sensitivities of politics surrounding individuals, and ultimately you'll get something done. But it has not been done in seven years, so it's going to take some time. 
And, and that's why I go back and I said earlier, it's going to take risk. Hillary, if she's president, or Donald Trump, if he's president, risking that base that we all read about and hear about that's not going to like it. Because if you're, if, if the way that, in my opinion, that life works, politics is no different. Incremental progress, making moves, and, and going forward down the field every week. You start here, you want to get there, but you know what? Next week you'll be here, and then here. Though, that's called compromise. If you don't get it all, then the Tea Party base goes nuts. And it's not just Tea Party, it's Trumpeteers now. <laughs> right? They're different. So again, it's risk taking, the ability to compromise, and wanting to do it, and risking your existence as an elected official. Yeah, my, and generally, they don't do that. Earmarks might help too, but that's just a whole nother <laughs> oh, step. Oh, you want to go but, there? But, but, but everything he said. I just want to say everything he said. That's exactly right. Well, he's trailing Rubio right now in delegates. I know. So, so I, but I think in some ways the answer to your question is I just, if he was close enough to have had a shot, I think you would have possibly seen a different outcome. I, the other, the other, I mean, just the, the, the way you phrase, I mean, there's no such thing as establishment. Right. The establishment is, is created in the, it's, it, right. I mean, quite frankly, the Milken Conference is right. This, we're, this is the citadel of the establishment. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I mean, like, there, there's, look, if, if there was. Ed said, how y'all doing? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, if, if there was an establishment, you, you wouldn't have Trump, you wouldn't have Cruz, you would have either had Jeb, Marco, or, you know, in Kasich would have been their VP. But it's, it's. You know, these aren't smoke-filled back rooms. Yeah, I so agree with that. And, and again, like, I, I get this question a lot, you know, in traveling um, abroad now, and people in, in, in political systems abroad and just ask, why does your party allow this? Why are there 17 candidates? And I, I, my response is, just like so much else in America, we're very entrepreneurial. There is no, you know, Captain of the RNC, I know Reince Priebus is there, but there's nobody saying, you can't run, or we've all got to go here. It is all about, you go get the money, or you have the ability to appeal to the press to cover you, you go build support. So, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. There's just this fiction of the establishment. What, who is that? We've got about 12 minutes left, so if you do stay short with your questions, I'll make them stay short with their answers. Go. Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren Chive. I run a bipartisan women's political organization. I was surprised, maybe I shouldn't be, that hasn't come up. Uh, the influence of, the impact of women on the elections since 1980, women have been one of the biggest deciding factors in every election since 1980. You guys didn't mention it. I have lots of Republican women who are telling me in a choice between somebody who's so evidently sexist and somebody even if is imperfect is not and is saying she's gonna put 50% women in the cabinet. For some people, not everyone, but certainly for some women that's a decider. I think there will be Republican women who support Hillary. But I just wanted to ask about this because I was surprised that you didn't mention it and it seems to me it's sort of the most important underrepresented story of this campaign is the impact of somebody so blatantly uh, with some challenges with women. I think it's to the tune of 70 points uh, and the impact of that on the election. I'd love you Yeah, to no, I mean, I, I think I, I raised that when I said the, the 2012, the autopsy report for the RNC was we need to do, Republicans need to do better with college educated women and need to tone down the rhetoric on, on Hispanics. So clearly Trump didn't get that memo. Um, <laughs> right, I mean, like it's, I mean, that's this, right? It's, the, it's Trump's 19th Amendment problem, right? The, 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 the women's right to vote, uh, that's, that's gonna be a big problem for Trump in a general. Uh, that's why my wife's not gonna vote for him. Um, but it's, it, in the Electoral College, it's the Rust Belt, it's Reagan Democrats, it's sort of, you know, a lot of, I mean, as Trump's numbers with women, horrific. Hillary's numbers with white men, Horrific, right? And it's it's really it's it's this self fulfilling prophecy of this race to the bottom. I think. And I'll just add. I think the four white guys on stage, of course, will blame Candy for not raising the question. Um, 
But I don't think it's an underreported story. I think this is the national narrative, and if it goes the way you predict, and I think I agree with you, I think you know, it will be understood that this is why he loses by 30 points, right? I mean, if he actually gets as decimated as he does in the exit polls show that he has alienated women across all ideology just based on a certain sense of disrespect, you know, I, I expect that will be the you know, Wednesday morning story. Yeah, I, th I think the, um, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that the history shows that ticket splitting doesn't happen quite as Not much as much anymore. it used to. So that's, a, I mean, it, you know, it may happen this time. I have no idea. Certainly there'll be some Republicans advocating that. But, um, you know, ticket splitting is, is more less and less a percentage of, of how the votes come in. I guess along those lines um, and further, ah. you guys. If we could just see the shadowy outline. Shadow of the outline of someone. <laughs> and I want to be hidden. Um, you guys talked a lot about the demise of the Republican Party and a bit about the demise of the Democratic Party. And it seems um, to me that with all this dysfunctionality across parties, uh, first of all, I don't understand why we have to have political parties, but I'd like your opinions on is there an eminent demise of the Republican Democratic, the dual party system? I don't think so. I run a place called the Bipartisan Policy Center, so that obviously, you know, <laughs> presumes some expectation of uh, sustain. <laughs> I mean, we need parties to help organize constructive conflict, right? Otherwise, you have referendum. How's that going, California? Right? I mean, the, this idea of transparency and direct democracy being a governing theory actually doesn't work so well. It feels good, but it doesn't work so well. So you know, the only way you get a third party is if you have somebody who's quite compelling with tremendous amounts of independent wealth. Right? Mike Bloomberg can make a run at it once. Um, but I don't see, I mean, the, the, the third party efforts have been disastrous. And they haven't produced winners or better electoral outcomes. And I think that's, that's, that's by the Constitution, right? The Electoral College is how you're elected president. If you don't hit 270 electoral votes, the House of Representatives decides the election with each state delegation getting one vote. Yeah. So how even an independent can win 270, let alone you know, a, a vote in the House, it's just that the system isn't set up to do that. You could change that, but you'd need a constitutional amendment, which are not the, the easiest thing. Last su successful creation of a, a new party was 1856, uh, when the Republican Party was born. And the best indicator you can have is that Bernie Sanders has never run as a Democrat, ever until this year. And he decided that in order to actually have a practical chance of success, he had to be a member of one of the two major parties. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about the down ballot. Oh, here, sorry. Down ballot. If you were advising a Republican candidate, embrace Trump or distance yourself from Trump. Uh, I mean, I, Trump does not seem like the most forgiving person, so if you're not with him, <laughs> that's fine. No, you know, I... It sounds I, like he has a long memory, too, so... You know, I, I think that what, what is going on today, especially in the, um, in the Senate races, is there's a real effort uh, for individuals in these swing states, and I'm talking about New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, all of whom are in the Republican category and up this cycle, trying to find their own identity quickly. Uh, because of the volatility around Donald Trump for some of the reasons that were just stated about the women vote, the minority vote, and the rest. It's just unclear. The conventional wisdom says, and the polls are indicating, um, that uh, with a one-on-one -on -one matchup, there's no question. So, right? er so, Eric, when one of these Senate candidates is asked, uh, you know, right. uh, Senator Ayotte, who are you voting for for president? I'm a Republican, and I support the Republican nominee, yeah. but I am... Um, I am Kelly Ayotte, and I've done we X, a, Y, Z. We had a candidate in Kentucky, very attractive uh, candidate. I was running a great, I think Allison Lundergan Grimes yeah. was her name. Yeah. She was very refused. prominent. She refused to answer and got the worst of both worlds. You know, she alienated the Democrats by saying she by refusing to say she was voting for Obama, and all the Republicans knew she was voting for Obama anyway. Right. So yeah. I just wonder how long they can kind of get away with that sort of. You, ha you have to go and say you're Republican. You'll support the Republican nominee. Uh, but I do think in a targeted way, you'll see campaigns going after these groups that are 
are feeling as if a Trump candidacy sets them aside. And I, I do think that that will, is going to be what you're going to see in these swing it, states. It, it totally depends what state you're in and what district you're in. Um, I mean, Wisconsin, Ron Johnson probably helped a little bit with Trump. Um, uh, but you can, you know, you got to run your own race, and it depends. I mean, Kelly Ayotte in New Hampshire, Trump's going to do well in New Hampshire. Um, but, I mean, like a, a Rob Portman in Ohio, a Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania, uh, Roy Blunt in Missouri, I mean, these are, you know, people are going to have to make that determination. I think I, I'm, I'm sort of following the people with the mics. Also, it wasn't Mitch McConnell who was already said, who, who would really like to stay majority leader in the Senate, has said, hey, if you've got to run ads against Trump, feel free. So it does depend on where you are and how that state's going to vote. Who's got the mic here? I do. Um, I'm from Idaho, most Republican conservative state in the country, and our neighbors in Utah uh, are saying by 10 points they won't, that they'll support Clinton over um, Trump. They haven't voted for a Democrat in four decades. Um, what about this? the Mormons and the religious right? Are they a factor anymore? Well, I mean, look, er, er, yes, everybody is a factor. And, I, and the only, I think we've alluded to this a couple of times, but Trump is not a static individual. And because he has said he agrees with everything at least right. once, <laughs> he is still, and the people supporting Trump don't, they're not supporting his policies. So, you know, he doesn't have an etcher sketcher to shake, right? I mean, he has a dartboard to just hurl stuff at. So he has a lot of capacity. I don't know if he has the personal emotional capacity, but he has the political room to become a presidential candidate. And, you know, we heard it at today's conference, right? We had, we had Lindsey Graham and, uh, you know, Bob Corker giving different visions of what's about to happen. I tend to think that, um, and I think you know, Eric was suggesting this, the majority of the party, if he continues to show the desire to be a Republican candidate, if he stands behind a teleprompter, doesn't swear at anybody, and makes a decent effort to say, I'm coming together, he hires some military advisors who've worked in the military, and he does some of the basic things that you want to do, I think he's going to look like a less alienating candidate. He could look like a less alienating candidate in November than he does now. A major question for, wow. like most Republicans with Trump, I think are cycling through the five stages of grief, <laughs> right? It the, starts the with problem. Den denial, anger, uh, depression, bargaining, acceptance. And if, if folks can get to that acceptance by November 8th, because it's a vote for the Supreme Court, it's a vote for Speaker Ryan, it's a vote for Senate Majority Leader McConnell, I think U Utah and Idaho will be there, but if they're still between denial and you know bargaining, yeah, you, it's Goldwater asked. Tr Trump, Trump does have to try and reinvent himself a little bit to take off the rough edges. The problem he's going to have is that uh, a lot of this is recorded on video. Oh. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we're going to have to have mass amnesia <laughs> because, you know, it's going to be, you know, he's going to be constantly said, now, wait a minute, <laughs> you may say that today, but here's where you were, you know, two months ago. So I think it's going to be a close election. Popular vote's going to be close. He's going to go hard negative on Hillary. That will resonate in uh, some quarters. Uh, he'll try and take his own soft edges off. We'll see if he can get away with that. And then he's got to go hard at that four or five percent that say, you know what, I don't like either of these folks. Uh, I'll go for a change. Let's I still don't think it, it you know, I still think because the Electoral College, he's got a heck of a uh, mountain to climb. And for our friend here, if, if, if Hillary Clinton is uh, leading, it wins Utah, we should save the taxpayers the money and call off the election. I mean, that's just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we should also point out that, that Trump did win the evangelical vote among Republicans in a lot of southern states. So it's not totally clear, because evangelicals also want jobs and are also angry about a lot of the things that have gone on. And that made Trump uh, his, whatever his religion is, which I'm not sure. Go ahead. Uh, it's more a question for, on the Democratic side. For the VP selections, hmm. uh, the Senate's so important. Why would, would you, why? is the list have so many U.S. senators on it that would be candidates? Why wouldn't you just knock them out right away? Because that would open up a seat if she does win, if you want the Senate. That's well, if you've got a Democratic governor, then the governor would fill the vacancy with another Democrat. Now that you'd have a, a special election in two years, which may be a tough midterm election, you know, that's kind of a, that's a, a calcul, a factor that I'm sure will be considered. But, um, you know, she'll go with the person she thinks gives her the best chance of winning and worry about the Senate seat later. If she's, got, if she's got two that she really is just conflicted about, that's an all else being equal kind of thing. There's, a, there's also a certain grace to putting a lot of people on the list at this point. 
Exactly. Um, which leads me, thank you very much, to my final question. Um, who's going to be Hillary's Veep, and who's going to be, if it's assuming it's Trump, assuming it's Hillary, um, which I think is the assumption basically up here, who are the Veeps on each side? Um, Gundam, uh, Tom Perez, the Labor Secretary, is Hillary's VP, and uh, Trump will take a uh, retired general or military leader. So I'm going to steal this one from J.B. Pritzker, because um, I think it's... Uh, Take a look at Al Franken. He, has, he is a progressive policy guy who would have a lot of fun driving Trump crazy. Um, on the uh, Republican side, I don't know if Admiral Stockdale is still alive. <laughs> but um, He's not. I, all right, sorry. And then not, well, now that makes me just feel bad. But, um, <laughs> but someone who could start out by saying, who am I and why am I here? Probably someone in that, in that cast. The only, the only thing I would differ with or just present is, you know, if you talk about where Trump's rough edges are, I mean, naturally, he would go to a woman. And why not go to a Hispanic woman? And Susana Martinez in New Mexico is an awesome individual. She's done a great job in that state. She's been critical of Trump uh, on the trail. But uh, for him to bring somebody like that onto the ticket, uh, I think would be a wise thing. But not as critical as Nikki Haley. So she's at least well, seems like I, a. Kind I think of that's pretty him. astute analysis uh, by Eric. So on our side, I'd say it would either be Tim Kaine from Virginia or Deval Patrick, Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts. On their side, you know, I don't have a clue, but uh, whoever would want to be number two to the Donald <laughs> reminds me of the old saying: uh, you know, a woman had two two sons. One grew up to become vice president. The other went to sea. Neither was heard from again. <laughs> but with Trump, you're playing for the impeachment, so you can become. <laughs> 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 nice close. Eric, I don't think you gave us Hillary's choice for Veep. No, I'm not even qualified to begin that discussion. Wait, so, uh, wait, we have to be qualified, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all, all of you so much, uh, Evan By, Eric Cantor, Jason Grumet, and Chris Kruger. Thank you guys. You were great. Thank you.